put it here. And here is the slide. Okay, so what I try to do today is to wrap up these weird systems we talked about, like a superfluid and superconductivity, and trying to sort of tie the knots in, in coming up with a, a common theme among, among them. That is this concept called spontaneous symmetry breaking. And once I'm done with this, then finally we move into photons, first trying to combine QFD with the relativity and then quantize the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the vector potential that ends up being the photon field. So that's the, 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 the subjects today. So let's get started with spontaneous symmetry breaking. I showed this slide uh, last week. So there is this uh, the theorem by Emmy Noether, which is really fundamental to phys fundamental physics. The symmetry leads to conservation law, but the opposite is also true. Once you have a conservation law, namely there's a conserved charge of some sort, and that conserved charge is actually an operator that generates the symmetry. And that's the idea I mentioned uh, uh, last week, but let me just uh, uh, review this once again. So one system has a translational invariant in space. So you can change X to X plus A, A is a constant. That's the overall translation in space. That is what leads to the conservation of the momentum. So you have P as a momentum operator that is independent of time. So that's a conserved operator. But once you put P in the exponent, this is what defines the unitary operator that acts on the Hilbert space of the quantum system that achieves the translation of space. The way you can actually verify this is by using this e to the IPA, IPA into this uh, unitary operator U. And here's some object that depends on space X and this is U inverse. So this is the unitary transformation of an operator Psi of X. And by definition it's written this way. And the way you can actually see this is that using this household's formula, the P in the exponent gives you basically multiple commutators. And P being the derivative, P times this, uh, the operator of Psi of X gives you derivative of Psi of X. If you do it twice, you get the second derivative of Psi of X. Three times give you third derivative of Psi of X. And because A is a parameter, this one comes with A, this one comes with A squared, this one comes with A cubed. And that's nothing but the Taylor expansion of Psi of X plus A around A equals zero, right? Because if you do the Taylor expansion, lowest order of the Psi of X itself, that's B. First order is A times derivative of Psi of X, that's this A, a B commutator. And second order play, uh, uh, this is a squared over two times second derivative of psi of x. That's precisely this third term. And a cube over three factorial, third derivative of psi of x. That's the last term over here and so on. So this unitary transformation is precisely what achieves this translation in space, x plus a. So by using this unitary operator U, which is given by the exponential of the conserved quantity, namely momentum in this case, it achieves a spatial translation going from Psi of X to Psi of X plus A. So that's how a conserved charge, according to Neuter's theorem, is actually what generates the symmetry in the sense that you use P operator in the exponent to write down this unitary operator of the translation. The same idea works for the spatial rotation. So R is a three by three orthogonal matrix for the rotation. So the rotation, that's why I use the symbol R. And, and so this is the symmetry of the system. Then you find the conservation law, namely the conservation of angular momentum. An angular momentum operator is J. And suppose you pick one axis for the rotation. So you define the projection of angular momentum in that direction and then they find this, uh, 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 the exponential, and theta is how much you rotate around that axis. So that actually give you the, uh, gives you the unitary operator of spatial rotation. And again, if you use this Hausdorff formula, you can act this on any of uh, operator that has some spatial direction like X, P, angular momentum itself, then you can work out this commutation relations and find that this unitary operator really does give you this three by three, three, by three rotation matrix. We talked about changing the phase of the quantum field psi. 
And, and this, of course, leads to a conservation law too. And it conserves quantity for this uh, symmetry turns out to be the number operator. And if you use the number operator and exponent, that defines a unitary operator of this phase rotation of the field. So you use this e to the i n theta from this side, e to the minus i n theta from the, the, the right hand side. And that is precisely this e to the i theta uh, times psi. There are some symmetries which cannot be done by continuously uh, called discrete symmetries. The parity is one example. You, by inverting space of x to minus x, this is not something you can achieve you know, gradually. You have to flip the entire space all of a sudden. So there is a not infinitesimal version of the parity, unlike there is an infinitesimal version of the phase change or infinitesimal rotation or infinitesimal translation. So these symmetries, which can do gradually are called continuous symmetries, while something like parity you have to do all of a sudden is what is called a discrete symmetry. And once again, you can define a conserved quantity P, which is not the same P as over here, it's not momentum, but, but it's a parity. So we use the symbol P for this one too. And parity operator is what flips the side of X and also P, but not J. And, and this, this operator by itself is a unitary operator, but because if you do it twice, the parity is same thing as not doing anything, because if you do sign change twice, that goes back to the original one. So P squared is one because of that. What it means is the P is the same as P inverse or P dagger, which means the P is Hermitian too. So P is an operator, which is both unitary and Hermitian at the same time with possible eigenvalues plus one or minus one because they need to square to one. And it turns out that uh, all the particles are eigenstates of the parity operator. If they are, uh, for example, the, uh, the photon has intrinsic parity negative. The photon is an object with negative parity. So each particle carries its actually own parity quantum number. That's a concept which actually doesn't come out in classical physics. Uh, because there's no notion of eigenvalue in classical physics. But in quantum physics, we do care about that. And the eigenvalue of parity is actually meaningful. And it is conserved, at least in electromagnetism and the strong force and gravity. But it's not conserved in nuclear uh, weak interaction. You might have heard of this idea that the nuclear beta decay actually violates parity. But most interactions do preserve parity. So you can always compare the eigenvalue of the parity operator for the initial state of some reaction and the final state of some reaction. And they are supposed to be the same. That's the meaning of parity being conserved. So anyway, so what I'm telling you here is that thinking about any symmetry of any kind, you can define a conserved operator according to Neuter's theorem. And that conserved operator turns out to give you the transformation uh, given by the unitary operator using that conserved uh, operator. So that's the idea of the Neuter's theorem, which is not somewhat extended now in quantum physics because the charge is conserved, but charge also generates the symmetry. So it can go both ways. Symmetry gives you conserved quantity, conserved quantity generates the symmetry. So that's the idea of the Neuter's theorem in, in quantum systems. Okay, so this is what I explained already last week, but uh, I went uh, rather fast. And so let me pause here if there are any questions. Everything okay? All right. And so this is the symmetry. Now comes the idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking. So suppose you have ground state of the system. So this zero this time is not meant to be the vacuum state. This is meant to be the ground state in this context. And suppose you also have a symmetry given by this unitary operator U. But there are cases where the ground state actually changes under the unitary transformation of the symmetry. Namely that ground state doesn't stay the same if you perform a symmetry operation. What that means then is the ground state uh, uh, doesn't respect 
that symmetry because symmetry ends up changing the ground state. One ground state would change to another ground state. So then the ground state does not respect the symmetry. And that's when we say the symmetry is spontaneously broken. So I told you this idea that once you have a potential like this one, and if you drop ball from the top, exactly on top of this uh, top of the hill, then in principle, it can just fall down here and stay there. But of course, we don't imagine that system will be stable this way. Just a tiny wind would bring it down all the way to the bottom of this potential. But depends on what tiny, where the tiny wind is, wind is blowing. So it may fall down this way, it may fall down that way, it may fall down this way. So you have infinite number of ground states in this case. And they are all degenerating energies because they are related by the symmetry. By definition, symmetry commutes with Hamiltonian, so energy doesn't change by acting symmetry. But symmetry is not respected by one particular ground state because the ground state changes under the symmetry transformation. So in this case, we say the symmetry is spontaneously broken. Symmetry itself is not broken because if you look at the collection of all ground states, there is still symmetry as a, collect, uh, as a set. But if you pick a single ground state, it doesn't respect the symmetry. And that's the meaning of the word spontaneously broken. So spontaneous is really this idea that once you actually drop the ball, spontaneously, it chooses one direction over the other. And you can't tell which direction is chosen ahead of the time. So that's the idea behind this name, spontaneously. And that mathematically is written in terms of what is called the order parameter. And this is a new material we didn't talk about last week. Suppose you have an operator that changes under the symmetry. For example, if you think about translation operator, translation operator would change X to X plus A. And that's an example of an operator that changes. If you think of the rotation operator, for example, momentum operator would change under the rotation. So just come up with some operator that changes under the symmetry transformation. But imagine that operator has an expectation value in the ground state. And what that means then is that if this expectation value is non-zero, then this is the mathematical expression for the spontaneous symmetry breaking. And, and that applies, for example, to ferromagnet. So if this changes under the symmetry, then this O, if you put U and U inverse in here, then this expectation value would change to a different expectation value, which means that this ground state is not invariant. It actually changes under the symmetry. So once you see this kind of expectation value of an operator that transforms in the ground state, and once you find it non-zero, and that's a sign that your ground state does not respect the symmetry. And we'll come back and talk about the case of ferromagnet in a few slides. So ground state of a ferromagnet is that you have spins all lined up. And original Hamiltonian has a symmetry of rotating all the spins together. So nearest neighbor interaction of the spins is this spin in a product with the next spin. So even if you do an overall rotation, the Hamiltonian is invariant. But if the spins are all lined up in one particular direction, then this spin operator has an expectation value in the ground state along the axis of the spins lining up. But under spatial rotation, spin operator of course changes. So this is an operator that changes by rotation, but has an expectation value in the ground state. What that means is that ground state it actually chooses one particular direction. And therefore the ground state does not respect the full symmetry of three dimensional rotation. It respects part of the rotation. The ground states with all the spins wind up, up in the positive Z direction, you can still do this X, Y rotation that is still respected by the ground state. It doesn't change, but the rotation around the X axis and rotation around the Y axis are not respected by that ground state. So that's the situation of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Ground state does not respect the symmetry in a sense that ground state would change under the rotation.
And that is manifested by this non-zero expectation value of certain operator, which changes under the symmetry transformation, in this case, ferromagnet. And there are many other examples of this. What we talked about is the BEC of uh, uh, cold atoms or superfluid of helium-4 or superconductor, they all have this common property that you have some expectation value of the field operator. In a case of Cooper pairs, you need to put in two fermion field operators. In a case of the Boson-Einstein condensate, a single field operator has an expectation value. But the point here is that the, the, the symmetry of changing the phase is not respected by the expectation value. So if you use the number of operator, I told you that you can change the phase of the field. What that means is the ground state does not respect the symmetry using the number of operator because that ends up changing the phase of this expectation value from one particular value to a different value with different phase. So that's an example of the order parameter too. So in this case, the number symmetry is not respected by the ground state. And indeed, what we saw was that the ground state of these systems uh, involves the superposition of states with different number of states. So the ground state doesn't have a definite number anymore. And that's how you see the number state is not respected by the symmetry. So that's an, an another example of the same idea. Once you have an operator that changes under the symmetry, and if that kind of operator has an expectation value of the ground state, then the ground state is not respecting that symmetry. And then that's a sign of the spontaneous symmetry breaking. And in the case of the ferromagnet, if you heat the system up, at some point, the magnetization would go down to zero. And that's a phase transition called the Curie point. And above this critical temperature, system loses the magnetization. And this expectation value would be zero above that temperature. So once you have this in order parameter, then you can talk about the phase transition from a phase where order parameter is non-zero to a phase where order parameter is zero by changing the temperature or various other uh, 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 external parameters like a pressure or uh, the, the external magnetic field, external electric field and so on and so forth. So in general, once you have this order parameter, then you, would talk about the phase transition of some kind. And in the case of the ferromagnet, this is the Curie point above which the magnetization disappears. In the case of the BEC, again, once you heat up the system, then you go back to the normal gas or normal fluid. And that's when you lose expectation value of the field operator and you have the phase transition. So that's the general idea. So let me sum it up. The order parameter is a sign of spontaneous symmetry breaking. And that would lead to a phase transition between phase with non-zero order parameter to zero order parameter by changing, for example, a temperature. And then you talk about the phase transition. So that's a general idea how uh, the order parameter uh, uh, is connected to the phase transitions in the system. Okay, again, let me pause here. I'm sure there are some questions about this. No, everything sounding familiar? Uh, I have a question. Go ahead, Shirag. Yeah. About the BEC state. So, mm -hmm. since it's an overall phase that, that's being picked and you can't measure it anyway, um, like, why can you characterize that as symmetry breaking? Um, let's see. So, it's, it's not completely correct to say that this not, cannot be measured. Once you have two condensates, at least we talked about the relative phase being measurable, which gives you the fringe pattern. So if you have one condensate already, from the point of view of one condensate, the phase of the other condensate is something you can measure relative to your condensate. And so, and, and here we're making the approximation of talking about the infinite system. So in the infinite system, then you have uh, basically everything so spread up in the entire space. And then you are already using one condensate as a reference. So in that sense that you can measure the absolute phase because you already have a reference point. In the same sense that once you have a, a rotational invariant system, the orientation you might say is not measurable 
but you need to bring in some reference to measure that. Once you have measured uh, the reference vector of some kind pointing in one direction, then you can measure the orientation of the magnet relative to it. And that's something you can measure. So, so you can say the same thing about the phase of the field and orientation of the magnetization. In either case, you need to bring in a reference to measure that. So once you actually have a reference, then the phase becomes measurable. Orientation of the magnet becomes measurable. So in that sense, we take these auto parameters to be a, a observables. And that's how we define the symmetry breaking. Does that answer your question, Shirat? Yeah, thank you. Okay, good, good, good. And that's a very good question, actually. Any other questions? Okay, and then how do we describe this phase transition using quantum field theory? And in this class, we are not dealing with quantum field theory at finite temperatures. So take this just as qualitative story. I don't, we don't go into quantitative detail. But it turns out that if you have a potential like this, uh, which we use for the case of the BEC, out in a, for the Schrodinger field, we have drawn this potential, which is positive chemical potential at the origin and quartic repulsive potential that would bring the potential upwards at the, uh, the finite amplitude. So that's the potential we used. But the idea is very simple. If you actually put this in a finite temperature system, as you start to raise the temperature, from absolute zero, gradually to finite temperatures, this shape of the potential start to change, namely the chemical potential mu, which gives you potential that falls down quadratically at the origin, starts to decrease. And at some point, the mu becomes zero and then negative. So that's the change here. So this is meant to be sort of cross section of this uh, potential. You just cut a half and look at the cross section. This is a zero temperature potential. But as you raise the temperature, mu chemical potential that describes this quadratic uh, negative curvature here starts to decrease, eventually becomes zero. And that corresponds to the, uh, the critical temperature. Then the potential is purely quartic, no quadratic term. And then if you go above the critical temperature, chemical potential becomes negative, which means the potential rises quadratically near the origin. And the minimum then is at the origin. What that means is that now the order parameter becomes zero. So if you continuously change potential from zero temperature to finite temperature, the order parameter had the value at the bottom here. But as the potential becomes less deep, auto parameter becomes slightly smaller. If it's even shallower, because even smaller auto parameter. And at the point when the chemical potential vanishes, then this is very flat at the origin, but nonetheless, the, uh, the, uh, the minimum is at the origin now. So that's the continuous change in auto parameter, like magnetization in the case of magnet, which smoothly go from finite value where spins are lined up in one direction, but as temperature rises, they start to randomize. And as you go to this critical temperature, the magnetization disappears. And above this temperature, there is no magnetization, there is no order parameter that corresponds to potential with a positive curvature at the origin, like this shape. So that's how we describe the phase transition in general using order parameter as a macroscopic variable. So you define the free energy at a final temperature as a function of the order parameter. And that is actually turns out to be the potential we have been looking at all along once you define the system at a finite temperature. So at zero temperature, free energy and internal energy is the same thing. So U minus TS is F, right? So at a zero temperature, TS is zero. So they are the same thing. But if you go to finite temperature, you need to subtract TS from it. And that defines these different curves as the temperature changes. And that's how you can describe the phase transition where auto parameter will smoothly go down to zero. But at the critical temperature, this curve is non-differential, non-differentiable. So there is basically a kink. And that kink defines the phase transition. And in this case, we say this is a second order phase transition 
as opposed to first order phase transition. In the case of the first order transition, there is a sudden jump in the size of the order parameter. And this is what, see, uh, what we see, for example, when the ice melts to become the, the, the liquid water. Ice is a crystal and crystal spontaneously breaks the translation symmetry. Each atom occupies a particular spot in space. If you do a translation, it is still another crystal, but a different crystal that occupies a different position. So translational symmetry of space is spontaneously broken in crystal. But if you heat the system up and once ice melts and becomes a liquid water, liquid water is smooth and nothing changes as a function of space. So you recover the translational invariance of space. But as you all know, then this change is actually a jump because if you reach the temperature of zero degrees Celsius, you have to keep providing heat for a while to turn the ice in completely into the liquid water, there's a latent heat. And that's actually given by this picture. So if you heat up the system of the ice, so this actually, uh, the, the auto parameter in this case is basically the position of each atom, that's the auto parameter now, which is not invariant in translation, expectation value of the position operator therefore means the, uh, the order parameter of the spontaneous symmetry breaking of translational symmetry. But up to the point the crystal melts, crystal keeps occupying a particular position. So order parameter doesn't vanish until the, the melting point. But once the ice melts into liquid water, then there's no particular position anymore. So the order parameter vanishes. So you have a jump from finite order parameter to zero order parameter. So this discontinuity is a sign of first order phase transition. So first order phase transition has a discontinuity in order parameter. Second order phase transition has a non-differentiability, but it's continuous in the order parameter. And that's the difference between first order and second order phase transitions. And as you already see in this picture, first order phase transition is characterized by this uh, potential or free energy at the critical temperature, where you have two minima with the same energies, which corresponds to ice and liquid water coexisting <coughs> at the same temperature. <coughs> and when you stay in this coexisting situation for a while, as you keep heating up the system, and then you eventually find yourself all in this uh, uh, liquid phase. So from the point of view of QFT, the first order phase transition is a tunneling phenomenon. You, you start with the minimum, you heat up the system, you find yourself right here, and then system tunnels from this to there, overcoming this potential barrier. And that's the melting going from ice to liquid. And then once the entire system is transformed to liquid, then you can further heat up the system and it stays there as a liquid water. And that's the idea of the first order phase transition. So depending on the nature of the phase transition, you use different functions for this potential energy. But idea is still the same. You stay at the minimum of the potential for the order parameter. And when the minimum is away from the origin, your auto parameter has a non-zero expectation value in the ground state and symmetry therefore is spontaneously broken. But once you go to higher temperature, then minimum at the zero auto parameter becomes the minimum and then symmetry becomes recovered. Your ground state now respects the symmetry and that's the common phenomenon for all examples we talked about. So that's the idea, how the idea of the auto parameter in spontaneous symmetry breaking is sort of a unifying theme across all of these different systems. And once you have auto parameter, you will be talking about a phase transition of some kind, either first order or second order, depending on the systems. <clears throat>
And I'm, I'm sure you have heard this kind of story elsewhere. And if you have taken the course on thermodynamics or statistical mechanics, then you hear more about these things. But this is the way we dis describe the, or the, uh, the, the phase transitions using the quantum field theory point of view. Okay, again, let me stop here. I'm sure there are questions about this general concept. No questions? Oh, I, I guess I, I, I had like, uh, like one question. Uh, this is all related to like uh, the renormalization group, correct? Like, uh, uh, yes. That's an okay. excellent question. Yes, we, we will not talk about renormalization group in this class, but yes, they are related. And so uh, uh, the renormalization group, uh, group can also happen in the following way. So if two spins line up in same direction, as a neighbor interaction. At the microscopic scale, you know the system prefers spontaneous symmetry breaking. The, but the question is, does the macroscopic system exhibit the same behavior? Because nearest neighbor interaction is an interaction with the range of only atomic scale. If you have a piece of magnet, you're talking about centimeter scale. So what do you know about the microscopic level may not directly translate to the behavioral system at the macroscopic level. Then renormalization group is an idea or technique rather, how to connect information at the microscopic scale to the behavioral system at the macroscopic scale. And then you ask the question, does the potential of the symmetry breaking type at the microscopic scale would lead to the potential also at the macroscopic scale of the same type? Well, in some cases, it can turn into this type as a result of changing the scale from microscopic to macroscopic scales. And going from this microscopic scale to macroscopic scale is what is called the renormalization group. So this is a technique where you would like to find out where system that prefers symmetry breaking at the microscopic scale would really lead to a symmetry breaking uh, at the microscopic scale. And that's actually not a trivial question. For example, I will mention antiferromagnet also in a couple of minutes where the spins are staggered like this uh, in the nearest neighbor. And if you have the one dimensional chain of the antiferromagnet, it could actually restore the uh, rotational symmetry once you go to macroscopic scale. And that also depends on the size of spin. And so there is much, much more detailed question about what system would exhibit spontaneous symmetry breaking at the macroscopic scale. And the renormalization group is a technique we use to figure this out uh, in quantum field theory. So they are related. And, and, and if you are not familiar with this idea, that's totally okay because we will not be talking about this subject anymore in, in this class, but this is the name, uh, you know, it's useful to remember renormalization group, which turns out to be a useful technique once you go to, I hope, graduate level quantum field theory class later on. Thank you for the question, Miguel. Is that, is that good enough for now? Yeah, okay. and I guess I had like another question, uh, like kind of related to like the renormalization group as well. So like, there's like this idea of like universality classes in the renormalization group. So like if the system Hamiltonian obeys a specific symmetry, uh, like you can, so if you have like two systems whose Hamiltonians obey the same symmetry, they have like the same like renormalization group flow. Like, um, so in this case, like this anti, or no, this ferromagnetic system with the, the continuous phase transition, mm -hmm. like that has like, the same symmetry as like the uh, the one day icing model, correct? Uh, icing model has a different symmetry. I, in oh, icing okay. model, spins are defined to point up or down. It's discrete. You can never have a spin pointing sideways, for example. Yeah, yeah. So this mm -hmm. is actually a discrete symmetry or parity we talked about a few minutes ago. But Heisenberg for ferromagnet has a spin that can point in any direction. So it is a continuous rotational symmetry. So they exhibit different behaviors. But well, you're right. So there is this idea called universality, namely that if two systems have totally different Hamiltonian, it's made of totally different atoms and so on and so forth. But if they have the same symmetry properties, the system will behave very similarly at the point of the phase transition. And that is the concept of universality. And uh, you can have, for example, uh, uh, two systems we have looked at 
is a superfluid helium-4, which has this linear rise of the excitation. There's a dip, but at the origin, it's linear. In the case of the cold atom BEC, you have linear that turns into quadratic. That's a Bogoliubo spectrum. But if you look at the system at the phase transition point and only ask the question of the behavior at the large scales, large scale using H bar corresponds to small momenta. You're looking at the behavior only at the small momenta. In both superfluid helium-4 and the cold atom BEC had this linear rise in the excitation spectrum. So they exhibit the same behavior at long distances. They have, they are totally different systems. One is made of, let's say, rubidium. Another is made of, let's say, helium-4. Totally different atoms. But they have the same symmetry, namely the phase change of the field. And the same symmetry. And therefore, at near the critical point, they exhibit the same behavior. And that's one example of universality. Okay, thank you for that question too. Any other questions? Okay, so what I would like to do now is I'm more, uh, actually give a little bit of a colloquium style talk. And this is not meant to be lecture. It's meant to be basically just a qualitative conceptual uh, story. I'd like to tell you how this spontaneous symmetry breaking is really useful in many, many different uh, systems. And this is actually a, a colloquium I've given in Germany uh, two years ago. And if you go to this link, you can watch the entire talk. And I'm just uh, uh, looking at only a very small piece of this talk, but I'd like to just convey how this concept of spontaneous symmetry breaking appears in many, many different areas of physics or even, even chemistry and biology. So just you know, sit back, relax, and this is not a lecture, just uh, I hope you will enjoy just looking at many examples of this idea. And so that's what I'd like to do and wrap up basically the first half of this course and then move into the relativistic QFD. And first example, of course, is a photon I mentioned earlier. So I really do encourage you to watch this uh, colloquium, which is meant to be pedagogical and, and also fun. So the idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking already appears in this rack of laundry. So uh, in Japan, at least, the dryers are not very common household items. So people hang the laundry to let them dry on a rack. And when I actually hang the first shirt, like this one here, you know, it doesn't matter whether I face the shirt to the left or right. And that's a symmetry of the system. Left and right has no fundamental distinction here. But if I happen to choose the first shirt facing left, then when I hang the second shirt, I have this tendency that I'd like to hang the shirt facing the same way, just to make it look neat. And third shirt facing the left, fourth shirt facing left. And if I'm done, I look at the rack and laundry and said, oh my goodness, why are all the shirts facing the same direction? And that's a spontaneous symmetry breaking. It really doesn't matter if they're all facing left or facing right. Physics is the same. Left and right has no distinction. That's a parity symmetry. But the ground state chooses one orientation over the other. And that's an example of spontaneous symmetry breaking. So in this case, parity symmetry is not respected by the ground state, namely all the shirts hang, hang, uh, uh, hanging uh, neatly in the same direction uh, uh, on, a, on a rack of laundry. And that chooses one orientation over the other. And that's the idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking. It appears in biology too. So this is Haribut, it's one of the flatfish. And you see both eyes are facing uh, on the right-hand side of the body. And obviously the fish evolved to have this funny shape with the eyes on the same side of the body because they wanted to protect themselves from predator by lying on the ocean floor, buried basically inside the sand so that the predators wouldn't notice these fish. So that actually protect them uh, uh, from the predators. Then for this purpose, they need to lie flat on the ocean floor. Therefore, they had to have put both eyes on the same size of the body. And this fish evolved in such a way. So when this fish is young, they still do have, like normal fish, one eye on the one side of the body, the other eye on the other side of the body. 
But as the as 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 as, as the fish matures uh, into adulthood, there's a metamorphosis, and one eye actually moves to the other side of the body, and both eyes ended up on the same side. But this fish always chooses to put both eyes on the right hand side of the body. Some other fish, flounder, chooses both eyes on the right hand side of the body. So that depends on the species. And I know they are different species because I eat both of them and they taste differently. The halibut has a clean taste, which is great for sushi. The flounder has a little earthy smell. So I'd, I'd actually eat it by simmering in sauce and both of them taste great. So they're delicious, but they're different species. So one species spontaneously chose one orientation of two eyes and the other species spontaneously chooses orientation on the other side. And so, you know, this is a species and written into DNA now, but you know, it was presumably just only spontaneously chosen. They could have chosen either way. We see different species choosing, making different choices. But if look at only one species of fish, they pick one orientation for the rest of their uh, fate uh, and it's written into genes. So that's an example of spontaneous symmetry breaking. That also happens in chemistry. If you look at the glucose, that's sugar, you can have two different orientations. They are again mirror image to each other. If you look at the top, so oxygen is either on the left or right of this chain and they have different shapes because of this. And we humans can consume only D glucose. We cannot digest L glucose at all because we rely on certain enzyme in our body and that enzyme can break up D glucose, but not L glucose. It turns out that entire biomass in our planet produces D glucose for the case of plants. So if you have the sugar cane, it contains sugar in it. They are all D glucose, no L glucose. And all the animals living on the planet can consume only D glucose and but not L glucose. And according to I could find in the internet, which of course I can't vouch for this, it's, it's, uh, if it's true or not, there is some very low level single cell bacteria that can consume both glucose. So this bacteria hasn't gone through the symmetry breaking yet, but all the more complex biological systems can either produce or consume only one type of glucose, not the other one. And therefore, somehow in the evolution tree of this entire biomass on the planet, we collectively decided to make a choice that D glucose is the way to go, not L glucose. And this is actually a money making opportunities for you if you are clever enough to come up with a manufacturing process that can produce this L glucose cheaply. Then you can be immediately a, a billionaire or maybe even a trillionaire because D glucose we cannot consume but tastes the same and chemically the same thing. So that is a zero calorie sugar, which is completely safe. And that's how you can make a, a become very rich. And so this is the way in, in three dimensional picture, how they look different from each other. Again, you see just exact mirror image from each other. One type we can eat and digest. The other time you can taste it's, it's sweet, but you cannot digest and therefore zero calories. So think about that. And all of these examples can be depicted using the same potential, right? So here's the potential as a function of X. This is X squared minus one squared. This potential has a symmetry of changing the sign of X, but it has two minima where X squared is one, namely X being plus one or minus one. And these two minima are related by the parity symmetry. That's why symmetry guarantees these two minima have same energies but the system has to choose one minimum over the other, like orientation of eyes on one side of the body, orientation of sugar, or the rack of laundry. So they are all described by the same idea of the spontaneously broken discrete symmetry. And what we talked about in class was rather on the idea of spontaneous uh, symmetry breaking of continuous symmetry. So th they are all described again by the same potential. Potential is invariant uh, under the rotation of XY plane. 
So that's an oval rotation of this potential in this shape. So this is rotationally invariant. And this is a continuous symmetry because you can start with small rotation and gradually go to large rotation. So they are continuously connected while inverting sine of X is an operation you have to do all of a sudden. And that's a discrete symmetry. There's no way of doing a little bit of reflection. There's no concept for that. So this is the symmetry breaking of a discrete symmetry. Now we're talking about symmetry breaking of a continuous symmetry. And that's the example of crystal. So I'm not talking about this frozen, but the frozen of this crystal of ice. And when you have the hot gas, they each molecule is moving completely randomly. They occupy random positions in space. But when you uh, uh, go to low temperature, all these molecules all of a sudden would neatly line up in a crystal. And each atom would occupy a particular position. So the translational symmetry is spontaneously broken. So that's the phase transition going from gas phase to the solid phase of this material. That's when the translational symmetry is spontaneously broken. And I can also add the rotational symmetry is spontaneously broken too, because the crystal has a definite orientation. If you rotate the crystal, it is still a crystal, but a different crystal with different orientation. And that appears also in the theory of magnet. And if you think about Heisenberg models, that is defined by the interaction of the spins at the neighboring sites. And interaction itself is completely invariant under the rotation of space. Under rotation, all spins rotate the same way, but inner product remains the same. So the Hamiltonian is invariant under the spatial rotation, and that's a continuous symmetry. And you have three different rotations around the x-axis, y-axis, and z-axis, and all rotations are respected by the Hamiltonian. But depending on the sign of this coefficient here, if the sign is positive, you have an antiferromagnet because energy is lowered when the spins are anti-parallel to each other in the ground state of this type called Nael state. But this state does not respect symmetry. It does respect symmetry of rotating spins around the z-axis because they don't change, but it does not respect the symmetry of rotating around x-axis or y-axis because the quantization axis will be different from the state you have chosen. In the case of ferromagnet, the sign is negative here. So this Hamiltonian prefers spins to be lined up in the same direction rather than lined up in the opposite direction. But the story is the same. When they're all lined up in one direction, again, they respect rotation around the z-axis, but does not respect rotation around the x-axis or y-axis. So in either case, rotational symmetry is spontaneously broken in a piece of magnet. So if you look at the magnet on the fridge, think about spontaneous symmetry breaking because the magnet chooses one orientation, even though the fundamental Hamiltonian is rotationally invariant. So this is a system which is a symmetry because symmetry commutes with Hamiltonian, but the ground state does not respect the full symmetry it spontaneously breaks two of the rotation symmetries, still does respect only one rotation. And that's an example of spontaneous symmetry breaking too. And we talked about superfluid. So in this case, the, uh, uh, the fluid is described by this quantum field Psi. And Psi has a symmetry of changing its phase arbitrarily. But once Psi has a condensate because of the coherent state, it chooses one particular phase. If you rotate the phase of the field, you, you still have the ground state, but that is now a different ground state because the expectation value has a different phase. And that difference of the phases is something you could see in the fringe pattern when you take two superfluids overlapping with each other. So in this case, this symmetry of changing the phase of the field is the symmetry of the system. But this system is spontaneously broken because the Psi has an expectation of value in the ground state with a particular phase in the coherent state. And it turns out that uh, this kind of uh, coherent 
uh, uh, the, the uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking appears also in astrophysics too. So we talked about this white dwarfs being the Fermi degenerate gas of electrons. And in that case, you don't have any condensate. There is no Cooper pairs we talk about. But in the case of the supernova explosion, in the end, the entire mass of the star gets squeezed down to the size of something like 10 kilometers or so, an incredible dense system called the neutron star. A neutron star is believed to be a BCS state. The neutron of this momentum and that momentum pair up, and you have a pairwise condensate, and you form a BCS state. And once you form a BCS state, you take a linear superposition of states with different number of particles in it. Then you have expectation value of two fermion fields inside the BCS state. You are actually working on that and in, this, in the current homework problem. And that order parameter changes its phase when you change the phase of each field. And so that's another system where the number symmetry is spontaneously broken. And in fact, ground state is not an eigenstate of the number operator. And therefore, once you do the phase change, one ground state would change to a different ground state. So supernova explosion would leave a neutron star and neutron star is a BCS state. Therefore, it's a manifestation of spontaneous symmetry breaking too. And this is actually how you can observe the core of the neutron star using the X-ray. An X-ray can see through this dust that surrounds in the neutron star. And you can still see the gas is actually scooting out from this core of the neutron star using X-ray observations. And that's a system of spontaneous symmetry breaking as well. And we also talked about superconductor. A superconductor also spontaneously breaks the symmetry of the phase change. In this case, the phase change can be done locally, namely different to one position to another because of the gauge invariance. But this is manifested in the behavior of the superconductor. So that's yet another example of spontaneous symmetry breaking. It turns out that the Higgs boson that was discovered at the AOHC in 2012 is also an example of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Higgs boson is a particle that is condensed everywhere in our universe in the empty space. So that's an example of Bose-Einstein condensate too. And in this case, it breaks a symmetry that would interchange the weak interaction of the nuclear beta decay and the electromagnetism. They are of the same kind related by symmetry. But because our vacuum or empty space has this condensate of the Higgs boson, just like the condensate of the cold atoms breaks this symmetry of the changing phase of the field, condensate of the Higgs boson breaks the symmetry between the weak interaction and the electromagnetism. And that ends up making the weak interaction very short ranged, even smaller than the size of an atom, 10 to minus 16 centimeters, while the electromagnetism remained the long range force. Now we see them as different kinds of forces. But if you go back to high temperature in the early universe, they must have been the same force actually. But because the Higgs boson developed the condensate when the temperature of the universe cooled to the level of trillion degrees, so we are living in cold universe, lower than trillion degrees of critical temperature, Higgs boson developed a condensated empty space that spontaneously broke the symmetry between the weak interaction and the electromagnetism. So these days in this cold universe today, we see them as something totally different from each other in the same way that we perceive the universe to point in one particular direction if we happen to live in a universe made of the ferromagnet. So universe, would have a orientation. There's no rotation symmetry in the, if you live, happen to live uh, a tiny part, a tiny uh, 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 a person living in a ferromagnet or our universe where we perceive universe to have a particular orientation to single out electromagnetism as a long range force while the weak interaction became a short range force. We don't see the symmetry anymore, but there was a symmetry at the high temperatures and that was actually related to the discovery of the Higgs boson. So all of these examples actually are related to spontaneous symmetry breaking. So that's the idea I wanted to convey in this little colloquium style presentation. And that this is an example where two protons come in and, and smash against each other. And you put incredible energy into the empty space. It's sort of like 
taking a, a piece of hammer and whack the, the vacuum. The Higgs boson is already there. So if you whack it, the Higgs boson just pop up and the Higgs boson that got popped up immediately decays into two, two photons. That is what you're seeing in this green energy deposit in the electromagnetic calorimeter. But that's how you see the Higgs boson already there in the vacuum. And that's what AOC, AOC managed to actually do. Okay, so this is just a qualitative conceptual discussion. If you go to my colloquium talk, that actually does have more quantitative discussions on what actually spontaneous breaking would lead to called the ghost on bosons. And, and also related to my own research, there was some puzzle about the behavior of ghost on bosons in the really a piece of magnet on the fridge, which we actually ended up uh, uh, understanding it in a systematic fashion. So that story is all in the colloquium. So I do encourage you to watch the, the talk, but for the purpose here, this is the end of uh, as a story, I'd like to stop here. Okay, so any questions about this overall idea that really connects uh, all kinds of different systems like rack of laundry, ice, uh, fish, sugar, Higgs boson, superconductor, superfluid, Bose-Einstein condensate, they all knit together based on the same concept of spontaneous symmetry breaking, which is a very powerful concept. And you have seen some examples of that in this course already. Okay, any questions? Excuse me, I need to blow my nose. Okay, no questions? Okay, now you know where we're heading to. Now we'd like to talk about a photon. So finally, we are going to see photon. So we have talked about Maxwell's equations and we talked about the fact that this is actually a very weird system. So if you actually have three components of B e and three components of B, you have six uh, unknowns, right? But you have actually eight equations here. Divergence of E being charge density, that's Gauss's law, that's one equation. Divergence of B vanishing, namely absence of magnetic monopole, that's the another question. And this equation has three components because curl E is a vector, B is a vector too. So there's an X component, Y component, Z component of this equation. That's three, already five. And the last equation for magnetic induction is also a three component equation. Curl B is a vector. So again, have X component, Y component, Z component. I have another three. So altogether, there are eight equations. And normally, if you have eight equations for six unknowns, you don't find solutions. It's over constrained. But it turns out though, that because we know the electric field and magnetic field are written in terms of scalar potential and vector potential in this way. Number of unknowns was actually not eight, not a six. Number of unknowns is actually four. Scalar potential is one component and vector potential with three components. So number of unknowns is actually four. And using this expression of the field strength in terms of scalar potential and vector potential, middle four equations are immediately trivially satisfied. Curl, sorry, the divergence of curl is always zero. That's the second equation among the Maxwell's equation. And if you take the curl, this gradient would drop out because great curl of gradient is always zero. So the curl of E is given by curl of A dot. That's nothing but negative B dot. That's why the second e third equation is also automatically satisfied. So you are only left with four equations in the end. So you have four equations for four unknowns, and that's why Maxwell's equations actually make sense. So here it says it, the four unknowns, scalar potential and three components of vector potential, and four equations, which is the first and the last among the Maxwell's equations. So that's how Maxwell's equations make sense. But now we paid a little price to come up with this understanding why Maxwell's equations make sense. We now use different variables of scalar potential and the vector potential instead of the field strength. But for a given field strength, there is a family 
of scalar potential and vector potential that will reproduce the same field strength because of the gauge invariance. And that's what we talked about before. Namely that if you change the scalar potential and the field strength, uh, the vector potential, you can reproduce the same field strength. But the field strength is all you care about in the equations of motion for particles. For example, if we have an electric field, magnetic field, you are describing the motion of electron inside, then the equation of motion is given in terms of the field strength alone. You don't need to even talk about scalar potential and vector potential. So if you two sets of scalar potential and vector potential will produce the same field strength, they are meant to be physically equivalent to each other. Namely, you have introduced an ambiguity in your description of electromagnetism. And gauge invariance is something we defined earlier in class uh, a couple of weeks ago. If you change scalar potential by a time derivative of some arbitrary function chi, and correspondingly, if you change the vector potential by the gradient of that arbitrary function, it should be the same function chi, then phi and A change in a correlated fashion so that the field strength do not change. And that's something easy to verify by this definition of the field strength. If you change phi by chi dot, this first term changes by gradient chi dot. If you look at the change of A, that's grad chi, here's a time derivative. So this is also grad chi dot, they cancel and E doesn't change. In the case of B, it depends only on a vector potential. And this is the curl of the grad chi that identically vanishes. So you can immediately see B doesn't change either. So by doing this transformation, which is an ambiguity in the definition of scalar and vector potentials, you can maintain the same electric and magnetic field. And that is what we call the gauge invariance. So whenever you describe electromagnetism, you need to make sure that your theory is invariant and the gauge transformation. So as long as you write everything into field strength, because the field strength by definition don't change under the gauge transformations, you are guaranteed your Hamiltonian and Lagrangian is gauge invariant. And that guarantees also that equations of motion of particles do not depend uh, on phi and A, depends only on the, on the field strength. So the field strength is what you would like to use to describe your uh, uh, Hamiltonian or Lagrangian, and that guarantees your theory is gauge invariant. But as you know, when you go to quantum mechanics, you use Hamiltonian for point particle that depends explicitly on the vector potential because your kinetic energy is one over two M P minus EA squared. That's when things become a little bit trickier. So gauge invariance doesn't seem to be automatic anymore because your Hamiltonian depends individually on the scalar potential and vector potential, not directly on the field strength. So gauge invariance is something we have to pay more attention to when you go to quantum systems, which we didn't have to when we are talking about the classical systems. So let me pause here. It looks like Cameron has a question. Oh, I don't have a question. Oh, no, 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 it wasn't the case? Okay, because your video immediately showed up. So I thought you were trying to ask uh, a question. No, my, my camera's a little buggy, so I, I'm hmm. just trying to fix it. Okay, does anybody have, else have a question about this? Of course, we went through this before, but uh, you know, in case there's something unclear about this. Everything okay? All right. So when we write down the Lagrangian, for in this case, I'm using this field for the Cooper pair of the electron as a charge 2E, we chose this particular combination called the covariant derivative, such that covariant derivative acting on a field would change by an overall phase local phase transformation, I emphasize again, and that phase corresponds to this function chi for the gauge transformation, namely that you actually do a phase change, which I didn't write on the slide, I'm afraid, then this Lagrangian is actually a invariant on the gauge transformation. Sorry, I didn't write it. So this covariant derivative is the combination we are supposed to pick 
in order to make sure that Lagrangian for the field in this case is invariant under gauge transformation. On the other hand, the Lagrangian for the Maxwell field is given by E squared minus B squared. And because this relies only on the field strength, it is guaranteed that the Lagrangian is now invariant under gauge transformation without even checking anything. And this is a question actually Dorothea asked uh, 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 earlier. It turns out that this particular combination of E squared minus B squared is the only combination you are allowed to write consistent with the Lorentz invariance, at least at the lowest order in a sense I'm gonna actually explain later on. And this particular Lagrangian, which is the only thing that's, that's allowed, uh, uh, that you are allowed to write, turns out to correctly reproduce the Maxwell's equation. So now Maxwell's equation is not an input anymore once you are listening this way. What you have to do is to use field strength, which is the gauge invariant object, to write down the Lorentz invariant Lagrangian for E and B. And that Lagrangian would predict the Maxwell's equation. So the Maxwell's equation now becomes a consequence, not an input. And that's not the, the way historical Maxwell discovered these equations, but modern point of view is symmetry first, gauge invariance is one symmetry, Lorentz invariance is another symmetry. If you put them together, this is the only Lagrangian you can write. And that only Lagrangian you can write end up giving you Maxwell's equation. So that's the way we understand it now. So that's the modern view I emphasized a couple of times uh, already. Symmetry first, Lagrangian next, and the consequences follow. So that's the uh, perfect example of this uh, uh, you know, modern view about how physical theories would arise. And in this case, that's actually a unique theory, it turns out, uh, that corresponds to precisely Maxwell's equations. Now that we have the Lagrangian, then we go through the same steps. We identify the variable, in this case, vector potential. We define the canonical conjugate object, which turns out to be the electric field. You set up the canonical commutation relation, and that would allow us to identify the harmonic oscillator hidden inside the field. And we can define the entire Hilbert space by starting from the vacuum state and keep acting the creation operator on top of it. That's the same steps we have followed in the case of the Schrodinger field. And there's a little bit of difference. First difference is that we are talking about multi-component field. Vector potential is a vector, so you got three components. So that's one difference. Another difference is that we have to make sure what we are doing is consistent with the gauge invariance. That's another difference. And what we have to do a little bit more work compared to the Schrodinger field theory to quantize the Maxwell field because of that. But the basic idea is exactly the same. You have a Lagrangian and you identify the variable, identify the momentum operator and set up the canonical commutation relation that allows you to define the Hilbert space and build up the Fox space with a different number of particles in it. And that particle ends up being the photon, which we wanted to see in quantum physics. So that's how we like to proceed. So any questions about the steps we are going to actually take from this point on? Because getting the concept is the most important thing. And once you start to follow the steps, it becomes a little bit more technical. So I hope the concept itself is clear at this stage. Any questions about that? Earl? Okay, good. All right, so let's get started then to follow through these steps. And it turns out that for the purpose of a discussion, Choosing Coulomb gauge is the simplest way to deal with this problem. And Coulomb gauge, as you know, is that you impose con this condition that the divergence of A vanishes. So this removes this arbitrariness we talked about in the definition of scalar and vector potentials for a given choice of the field strength E and B. So once you impose this Coulomb gauge condition for a given field strength E and B, vector potential is uniquely determined, and so it's scalar potential. So we have removed this ambiguity, uh, which we didn't know how to deal with so far. So let's impose this condition. And of course, you can go to a different gauge too, but this turns out to simplify the discussion the most. And once you impose this Coulomb gauge, 
the Gauss's law, which is divergence of E, that contains A dot in it, but divergence of A dot is time derivative of this Coulomb gauge condition, so that vanishes. So the only piece that remains in this Gauss's law is the Laplacian of scalar potential. So we find this Poisson equation now. So Laplacian of phi is given by the charge density. And we know how to solve the Poisson's equation. Namely, scalar potential is no longer an independent variable. You can eliminate the scalar potential by using the solution to this Poisson equation. So the scalar potential is something we can forget about and then just talk about the theory as a function of the vector potential alone. So that really simplifies things. So then all we have to do is we quantize the vector potential. And in the Gauss's and uh, the Coulomb gauge, the electric field, now that we actually solve for this uh, scalar potential and eliminated it, and there's a piece that basically corresponds to the Coulomb potential between two charge densities. And I'm actually leaving that piece out. I'm only focusing on a piece that depends on a vector potential because that's what we would like to quantize for now. Then E squared term is just A dot A dot. There's a cross term of A dot grad phi, but if you do integration by parts, that becomes grad A dot times phi, and that vanishes because of Coulomb gauge condition, so there is no cross term. There is a piece of grad phi grad phi, but that's something you can rewrite using solution to Poisson equation that just becomes the Coulomb potential between rho one of x minus y rho, and I'm leaving that out because that doesn't depend on vector potential. So for the first term of E squared, this is the only term we should focus on, which depends on a vector potential. And looking at the BB term, again, within the Coulomb gauge, I can simplify BB term into this form of del J AI, del J AI. So this is the form of the Lagrangian now we would like to quantize then the obvious thing to do is focus on <coughs> the variable A and its time derivative A dot and derivative of the Lagrangian density with respect to A dot is actually this conjugate momentum. So forming the Lagrangian is actually more similar to harmonic oscillator because A, it plays the role of the variable. So this corresponds to X so the first term coming from E squared, it's nothing but X dot squared. That's the kinetic energy for the harmonic oscillator. Second term doesn't depend on time derivative of X. So this is actually what corresponds to X squared. And this derivative in momentum space becomes the wave vector. So they become numbers. And that wave vector defines then omega squared of the harmonic oscillator. So this Lagrangian really does have the form of P dot, uh, P squared minus X squared. So then you know how to do the mode expansion. Namely, in the mode expansion of the harmonic oscillator, X turns out to be A plus A dagger. We are talking about the field, so that depends on X. By doing the momentum mode expansion, we define the individual wave vector modes or momentum modes of P. And for every momentum mode, it's, it's something like X operator. So we expect the form to be X plus X dagger. So it turns out that this is the correct mode expansion. And A dot plays the role of P. And in harmonic oscillator, P was A minus A dagger. In the same way, after momentum expansion, then A dot is given by A minus A dagger for each momentum mode. This is the way we can expand both A and A dot in terms of the mode of the momentum modes. So now what we have to make sure is that A, A dot are canonically conjugate to each other. So we make sure that they satisfy the canonical commutation relations. And I already know that this ends up satisfying the commutation relations. It, that's why I actually wrote this in a suggested form of in terms of creation and relation operators. So we just verify by putting this expression into a a dot commutator that it comes out to be really delta function of delta x minus y. That's why we verify. 
using the standard kernel computation relations between A and A dagger for each momentum mode. So this is the suggestive form. We haven't verified that yet, but it turns out that this is the correct form, which satisfies the correct canonical permutation relation between A and A dot. Assuming and little a and little a dagger satisfy the usual commutation relations for the harmonic oscillator. So that's something we would verify on the next slide. But anyway, the, the point here is that by doing the Kuro gauge, your Lagrangian looks simple, looks like a dot squared minus a squared for a given momentum mode. That's the same kind of Lagrangian as a harmonic oscillator. So we expect a vector potential, which is basically x, is written as a plus a dagger. A dot, which is basically p, is expressed as a minus a dagger for each momentum mode, which suggests we are supposed to do a mode expansion like this one. And on the next slide, we verify that this is indeed the right mode expansion. OK, any questions about this idea of how to introduce the mode expansion, just like we have done with the Schrodinger field, but it's actually even more analogous to harmonic oscillator than the Schrodinger field. Any questions about this? Oh, I, I have a quick question. Go ahead, go ahead Riley. Um, are we, uh, since the A dot brings down like a minus I factor mm -hmm. and also an omega in mm -hmm. the square root, mm -hmm. is there also like a phase with omega T? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So here I'm, I'm choosing the, uh, the Schrodinger picture so that the operators don't depend on time. So A and A dot operator are defined separately in the same way that X and P operators are defined independently in quantum mechanics. But if we switch to Heisenberg picture, then you're completely right. I can think of A to be time dependent operator then I need to put in e to the minus i omega t over each bar here. In time, the probability will extract omega from the exponent. And that ends up canceling square root of omega downstairs and putting uh, a square root of omega upstairs as a result. And that's how you can understand that they are really related by time derivative once you go to Heisenberg picture. So here, I'm using Schrodinger picture. That's why operators don't depend on time. I'm treating A and A dot to be independent operators. But if you go to Heisenberg picture, the, 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 this discussion becomes even more transparent. And we will do that later. But since we have used the Schrodinger picture when we quantize the Schrodinger field, I'm trying to do it in a, a, as much the same way as possible to draw the parallelism uh, to uh, make it more easier to understand. And we will come back and talk about the Heisenberg picture, which actually simplifies discussions, but only later on. Thank you for that wonderful question, Riley. Okay, thank you. Um, I also had another more technical question. So. Mm -hmm. When we look at the Lagrangian and we see the, the del J A I, mm -hmm. uh, in practice, uh, if we act, how would acting like the gradient on this A field work? Yeah, so this would gradient it... would act on X in the exponent that will okay. pull down P over H bar. And you have two of them, sum on top of a J. So that gives you P squared over H bar squared. Mm -hmm. And that's basically the energy of the photon squared over C squared. So that's how that ends up being the angular frequency of the harmonic oscillator. Okay, I see, that, that makes sense, thank you. Okay, that's a good, very good question. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Okay, go ahead, Cameron. Um, so in this case, the way how we've defined A, um, when we actually go to take A dot, your time dependent part, is it just that exponential like E to the I, um, ET over H bar? Yeah, so if you go to Heisenberg picture, you have e to the minus i omega t. So time derivative will pull out omega from the exponent. That changes this omega downstairs to omega upstairs, and that, that's it. Right. But in right, Heisenberg cool. picture, um, I have to deal with them independently. Okay. okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, I have thanks. one more question. Oh, uh, go ahead. So for the, can you just go over your second bullet point with um, the scalar potential? So you fixed it by um, obviously like your Poisson equation, but right. in for this Lagrangian, I guess, are, are you assuming that there's matter pre or like a, a source charge present or just radiation? 
Yeah, so he, this Lagrangian has only radiation field in it and no matter fields. But even if you do have matter fields on top of this, phi can be eliminated using the solution with a Poisson equation. So it, it doesn't, it's not an independent variable. So when we quantize the system, phi is not an independent dynamical variable. All we have to think about is how to quantize A. So that point remains even in the presence of the matter fields. Okay, that makes sense. Um, okay. Well, I mean, since, since you are working without, I guess in the Lagrangian, since it's just radiation, mm -hmm. that like the scalar type zero, like could you just use another gauge? Um, uh, you can go to another gauge if you like, but then you have to think about how phi in the other gauge, which is now a, a, a variable, actually goes together with A in such a way that there is some combination which is not dynamical. So this, this discussion becomes a little bit more complicated and that's why I'm not doing it that way. Okay. Thank you for that question too. And I'm running out of time. So let me just give you an idea how things goes next and we'll come back and talk about it of course on Friday. So now that we came up with this mode expansion, what we would like to make sure is that they correctly satisfy the, uh, 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 the, um, the canonical uh, 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 commutation relation. So conjugate momentum to A is the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to A dot, because there's an A dot twice that cancels the fact of two, but epsilon naught remains dielectric constant of the vacuum. So canonical conjugate momentum is epsilon naught A dot. So you wanna make sure that A epsilon naught A dot commutator is IH bar delta function for each component. So that's a chronic delta IJ. So that's the complexity due to the multi-component nature of the A dot. And it turns out if you put this mode expansion in using the standard commutation relation between creation and relation operators, which is this one, then it does satisfy this canonical uh, 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 commutation relation uh, among the field operators. So it works. But there's yet another con con uh, complication because the Coulomb gauge condition. So the way it is now doesn't seem to satisfy this Coulomb gauge condition. But the derivative pulls out P from the exponent. So Coulomb gauge condition then turns out to be this condition for each mode of annihilation creation operators. So we have to solve this. So the way you would do it is to write A, there are three components of them, but they have to be orthogonal to the momentum vector. So there are only two surviving components, which we parameterize using this, what is called the polarization vector. For example, when momentum is pointing in this direction in the spherical coordinates, then you come up with two other vectors that are orthogonal to it. And then you define two sets of annihilation operators for each of these orthogonal vectors. So that's the way you satisfy the Coulomb gauge condition. So instead of having three annihilation operators for each X, Y, and Z directions, you have only two annihilation operators labeled by lambda, and lambda refers to either choice of this orthogonal vector or that orthogonal vector, both the orthogonal to the momentum direction. So I have now two independent sets of the creation annihilation operators. So that's how you satisfy commutation relations and a Coulomb gauge condition at the same time. And then what you do next is exactly what you have done before, namely using these creation annihilation operators, you define, sorry, I'd like to move to the yet another slide. You define the Fox space of building up states acting the uh, uh, creation operators on top of the ground state or vacuum state. And all these multiple creation operators acting on the, the vacuum state defines one photon state, two photon state, three photon states, and so on and so forth. And Hamiltonian is diagonalized using this creation annihilation operator and energy for the each photon turns out to be exactly what you expect from Du Bois relation, namely H bar times the angular frequency, where angular frequency is given by speed of light times the wave vector. And thus you find the photons so the process is exactly the same thing as a Schrodinger field. And now you find photons. So that's what you are supposed to see on Friday. Once again, we go through these steps because I rushed through it. But anyway, finally photons. And uh, who is this commenting on it? Righty, okay. Thank you for the comment. All right. So that's the idea for today. Uh, any questions?
Okay, good. So we go from there on Friday. See you then. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Professor.